During our U.S. Men's National Team Abroad Series, many have been asking more about Christian Kappas. So due to that, we decided to bring Christian Kappas to the channel. And today's episode is a full interview with Christian Kappas, a 30 minute long interview, almost 30 minutes. So please enjoy, sit back, relax. A lot of the questions you guys asked, I asked them so you can get to know the new midfielder for the U.S. that plays at the Danish League, also got some Europa League minutes as well, and maybe we'll see him in the U.S. Men's National Team in the near future. So sit back, relax. Hit that like button while you're at it if you enjoy these types of interviews. We'll most certainly be doing more of them if it does well and if you guys enjoy it. Thank you for watching, guys. Let's roll the interview. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode here, another interview here on the channel with a player that many have requested. So all of you have been asking me about Christian Kappas, and no one better to talk about Christian Kappas than Christian Kappas. Maybe your dad. Maybe your dad would be better, but you can talk <laughs> about yourself. How are you doing, Christian? I'm good. Thank you for having me. So, Christian, before we start anything soccer-related, I want to talk real quickly about yourself, where you were born in the U.S. I know it was in Texas and grew up playing soccer. Now you're in Europe. We're going to get to that topic very soon. So where were you born? How did you start playing soccer and all that? Yeah, uh, I was born in Houston, Texas. Uh, lived there pretty much my whole life uh, growing up. Um, and I think I started playing when probably when I was two years old, pretty much. As in, From what my parents tell me, at least, I kind of always had a ball around, even when I was super, super young like that. It was just something that I... I love to do and I enjoy doing um, and I just kind of stuck with it you know I played you know every kid plays some basketball and some baseball and stuff like that when they're young and I just love soccer I love playing it and I was good at it and I liked winning even at that young age so I kind of stuck with You're it Brazilian. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, yeah that's kind of how I started out um, and then I lived in Dallas for a year and then came over here uh, to Denmark. We're going to get to that too. So uh, it's interesting, you almost sound like a Brazilian guy because I was I was also born in Brazil, raised there. And we when people ask me, when did you start playing soccer? When did you fall in love for soccer? Like, I don't know. My parents say when I was born, one year, two years. <laughs> exactly. So Christian, now talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about soccer now, your, your actual playing style, everything. So for everyone that hasn't watched you play, you came out of the FC Dallas Academy, right? And now mm -hmm. you're at Brabby. That's how you say it. That's how you told me to say it. Brabby, yeah. yeah. Brabby. <laughs> at the Danish League. So talk a little bit about what position you normally play in the midfield, right? What role do you usually play and which one maybe you prefer more? How's the season going? Update us a little bit on that. Yeah. Uh, so I think... I think I can play, I think my, I think everybody can agree. I definitely play central midfield, uh, but you know, whether it's a six or an eight uh, position, it's, I think that kind of depends on who you talk to and kind of what uh, the coach or the team uh, prefers uh, at that moment. Um, you know, I've played, you know, at my old club, we played, you know, with two sixes pretty much. And then now here at Bronby, I'm, uh, really a number eight uh more of an attacking player and so it really kind of depends um how the team plays and what the team needs um and i can try to i can do either really to be honest with you and uh, but i think for me i feel like i prefer playing more of an eight position because i'm definitely not uh a number Ten, so to speak, um, but I feel like I can do more in the attacking phase than a number six does, where they kind of have to help and support the defense as well. Um, so I would say that's kind of probably for myself my preferred position because I can just kind of uh, do a little bit here, do a little bit there, do a little bit kind of all over the place. So you're saying where you, you were playing on a, another club in the Danish league last season. Now you're in Bromby. And you, there they play dual sixes. So you had more defensive responsibility. Now you play, they play what now? More of a 4-3-3? Uh, we'll play like actually like a 5-3-2 uh, almost with three center backs. 5-3-2, um, 3-5-2, three, three, however you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. 
but we'll play with one six and then two number eights that are very attacking uh, minded. And you have only been playing at right now this season. You're only playing as an eight. Yeah, right now. Yeah. So we've done some different things in practice, um, of course, but every time in the game, it's been uh, as a number eight. That is good. That is good to know. More box to box midfielders that we need there, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get into names that I, I want to, some players that I want, but you can become an option here in the U.S. men's national team soon. And also the fact that you can play the six. Usually players that can play the eight, a lot of the times they can play the six in one way, shape, or form, usually. Yeah, now, I would definitely agree with that. Now, um, let's talk one thing real quick before we go back to your, your Danish league. I wanted to ask you a little bit about to touch upon the FC Dallas Academy, right? How many years you were there? Um, we talked about briefly off screen about players you played with there as well that are also being successful in Europe, just like you. And also maybe try to tell us why is this academy working so well, right? Because they got you. You're playing the, the Danish first division right now. Uh, you also you also had your, I want you to talk about later. You had some setbacks in your career because of um, documentation some issues with that, right? Yes. I yeah. Know. So. You could have been even more right now in Europe. You have Weston McKinney that came out of it, Chris Richards, and then you got guys like Ricardo Pepe now, Justin Che. So why don't you, and I might have missed someone, Brian Reynolds. I might even miss someone because there's so many. <laughs> so tell us a little bit how long you were at the FC Dallas Academy, uh, a little bit of why you left. Let's go by parts. Tell us how long you were being. Yeah. So I was actually only in Dallas um, for one year. Like, uh, that was it. Um, I played uh, at a club in Houston called Texans SC. Um, and I played there for many, many years. Um, and just over time, I as I started to grow as a player and become better and better, um, they kind of saw and were like, hey, like, you know, would you want to come play with us? You know, we know you're, you know, a little bit older and you kind of only have, you only have one year left really in the academy system, uh, age wise, but you know, we want you to come play for us. And then, uh, you know, if you do well, there's opportunity for a first team that I didn't have in Houston where I was playing at the time. So obviously everybody knows that, in my opinion, that's probably, you know, one of the best, if not the best, the academy uh, in the US to produce professional players, you know, and they have, like you said, a long, long list of players. And that was only, you know, five or six, you could probably name 15 or 20, you know, mm -hmm. if you really look at it. and. Uh, I think that the, obviously I don't really have experience with a lot of the other academies, but for me going to Dallas, it was just such a professional organization and the way that they integrate players into the first team, uh, slowly, you know, it starts with, you know, just trainings and stuff like that and getting you used to playing with a first team at that level. Um, and then you go back and you play games against kids your own age and you can just you know, almost run over them because it, you know, there's, you were used to playing at such a speed. Um, and they, I would say they never let their players get comfortable. From what I saw, it was even younger guys that were, you could tell were above their age. They just play up and challenge themselves every time. And so, and that's all they were about was teaching and learning and challenging you to become the best that, the best that you were. And even if you were, doing really well there was always another level always another way to challenge you and taking the most out of yourself so they wouldn't really let any player get comfortable no not at all you know it's like if you excelled with you know a u16 team then you got put with the u18 or u19 team and then if you did well there then you got put in the first team and it was it's kind of those steps and they do that from what I can tell from like 12 years old or something like that. I don't know how they, how young they go anymore, but, uh, they do that through the whole system and the whole academy plays the same way as the first team. So it makes it a seamless transition when you go from team to team. Um, you don't have to worry about learning, you know, an entirely new position. It was just, if you're good enough, you're going to play sort of a thing and they're going to challenge you every step of the way. If you're good enough, you're old enough, right? Like Sir Alex Ferguson said. <laughs> exactly. Now and you can even see that with the first. You played Alana, with, um, with in your class there. You played with Chris Richards. Was there anyone else that was with you that we can remember right now? Uh, we had Tanner. Uh, oh, Tanner. We had Thomas Roberts. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm trying to think who else came from. Don't wanna, you don't want to forget anyone, right? So they don't call you out after. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I think I think those are probably three of the ones that have kind of uh, kind of made a name for themselves. Um, Pepe was around every now and then. Uh, he was much younger. younger back then, but he, I mean, he's still young now. But yeah, oh, all <laughs> of you are young. All of you, you're 22 right now. Yeah. Yeah, Chris Richard is 21 or 22 as well. You're all still young. You're still all still in the the prospect range, reaching slowly a more established age, and then prime probably in five years or so. But uh, at the end of the day, you went to the academy, and then eventually you ended up leaving and you went abroad. You didn't stay in MLS, right? Was that? I, I, I know a few of the reasons, obviously, uh, but was it more of a career decision or was some issues with them? What exactly happened for you to choose this path? Yeah, uh, it was there. There there was, of course, issues, uh, you know, where I didn't really get a choice in, in a sort of a way. You know, I was playing in Dallas, uh, like, like we talked about, and at a certain point in the year, they said, you know, hey, we want you you know, to become part of our, our first team, you know, uh, full time. So they were like, there is this issue where it's a territory role, uh, something like that. And we kind of knew that when I was going there. Do you want me um, to but, explain it real quick, just for the viewers instead of you? Do you want me to say it real quick? Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. And do yeah. That. So guys, real quick, so he doesn't have to criticize MLS. I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> So MLS has this rule, which some of you might agree, some of you might disagree. I personally don't agree. And I've talked to this in the past in regards to how it affected Caden Clark as well. Okay, I'll talk about that as mm -hmm. well. It affected many players, actually. Um, I think I believe it affected Kate Cow as well from the San Jose Earthquakes. MLS has territorial rights. So, for example, as Christian said earlier in the video, he was born in Houston. Therefore, if Dallas wants to sign you, they need a deal with Houston, right, for the first team. Yeah. It, yeah. So essentially, that's what it is. So where you're born, that local club or whatever, whatever the rules are, I don't look into it because I really don't like some of the MLS regulations. He couldn't play for FD's, FC Dallas unless FC Dallas negotiated with Houston and probably paid a fee or something, some type of negotiation. But keep going, Christian. Sorry for that. No, yeah. I mean, that's basically how it is. Um, and so, uh, but like I said, we kind of knew that when I went to Dallas in the first place, but we just thought, you know, hey, like, I've never played for Houston. I didn't really have nothing to do with the organization. Uh, it really shouldn't be that big of a deal, right? And then in, when we came to that to that process, the, the league basically said, no, like, this is the rule. Like, it, it kind of is what it is sort of a thing. And, you know, I, and we, I basically said, like, I'm not going to go play for a team that didn't really invest anything in me, um, you know, because I was in Houston my whole life. And... They never really, you know, did much to try to bring me in. Uh, whereas Dallas, which is, you know, on the completely other side of the state, uh, you know, really invested a lot of time in bringing me in and making me feel comfortable. Um, and so I was like, if I can't play here, then uh, I'm just, I'm going to take my chance and go to Europe, which, you know, it's weird to say, but, you know, it's, you know, I think everybody and every kid that plays wants to play in Europe. You know, mm -hmm. so it was kind of like already in my mind, even in Dallas, that like, okay, maybe when this is, this is over here, I can go to Europe, right? I don't, maybe I don't need to play in the MLS sort of a thing. And uh, when it all kind of came together, it was almost like the decision was made for me. I didn't really have to make that decision um, because it was a no brainer uh, for me to, to take my chance and to come over here. So essentially, uh, and obviously, if you want to respond to this or not, you were you were willing to play for FC Dallas. If they offer, if you were allowed to, you would have played for FC Dallas, probably. I definitely would have considered yeah. a lot more than I than I had yeah. to. Yeah. So congratulations, MLS. You let a player skip. But <laughs> um, in regards to that, so you ended up going to Denmark, uh, which you you've been how many seasons there now? Three. Yeah, about three. Yeah, three. And then you had a little bit of issues last season in regards to documentation. And then you almost left, right? And then you you figured it out. Because I remember I was covering you on the Americans Abroad. And then there was a period of time that you weren't playing. And it was weird. 
and and then i remember I, I would get some updates i think it was from your dad on twitter he would put updates out and that's how I, we would follow through and then finally this season everything seems 100 fine are you okay talking about that what happened i mean yeah i mean pretty much what happened uh in order to work in any other country you have to have you know a work visa uh -huh. um and so i had my visa when i when i got there and it was all good and then at a certain point uh it had to be renewed um just because of how it was done um we had to renew it so i can stay in the country and i can work um and for one reason or another it didn't get done um and uh nobody knew so you know one day the police call and the club and are basically like this kid he's <laughs> he can't he can't be here pretty much it was i mean it was uh pretty much like getting deported in, in a short story um mm -hmm. there was a lot of things in between but pretty much I, they were like you don't have a visa you can't be here you can't work here like you can apply for a new one but for now you can't be here so i like i actually had to leave denmark i i left um and i was it probably took you know I was probably out of the country for three weeks in the middle of the season. Um, and before my new visa was processed and everything like that. And so, and then I came back and I mean, after that, it was just, you know, getting back into games and stuff like that. Um, but that's, you know, a long story short, that's kind of what happened. Yeah. And that definitely doesn't help at a young age while you're going through the season, you have to leave. So pretty much ruined your last season. And then, Thankfully enough, and now you're in a you're in a better team too. Now you were able to upgrade. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, for sure. I think Bronby yeah. is one of you know probably top two, three clubs in Denmark for sure, without a question, and one of the best uh, in Scandinavia. I think for sure. And congratulations on yesterday. You got how many minutes? You got some minutes on the Europa League match yesterday. Twenty. 20, yeah. 25, something like that. So, yeah, you, it was. <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, it was cool. Um, thank you. It was, you know, the European games are always really cool. And I didn't get a chance to play in the, you know, the Champions League games because I was uh, sick and stuff like that. So uh, it was, it was really cool for me. And, you know, it's something that, you know, you see on TV growing up, but to actually get to play, it's, uh, it was pretty cool. You'll get the Champions League minutes soon. But let's talk <laughs> now, now that we talked a lot about clubs, um, let's talk about U.S. men's national team a little bit. And the first thing I want to talk about is your experience with it because you were in the U-20 camp in 2019, right? Um, yeah. How was that? Who was the coach at the time for that camp? Who were the players with you? How was your experience? What teams did you face? Just talk about it as much as you want. Yeah, um... So the coach for that, for our, our group was Tab uh, Ramos. Mm -hmm. He was the coach and we had a, we had actually a really, I feel like a really strong team. Um, a lot of good players in, in every position. And then the second guy that wasn't starting was also really good. Um, and I think you can see a lot of that team is now playing, you know, either at a really high level now, um, whether it's in Europe or, or not. Um, but we had, you know, that whole, that whole maybe two years of basically getting ready for the World Cup um, at the end of it. And so we had multiple camps, multiple, lots of games, uh, just trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what the group was, what the team was going to look like going into, going into that. And so, Uh, we played a lot of different teams, a lot of really good teams to challenge ourselves and to 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 get better and to learn. Um, and then I didn't uh, have the chance to go to the World Cup, but they did uh, really well. I think it was the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. um, they made it to and they played really well and they lost to a good team. But that whole that whole tournament following it, you know, you get to play, you know, you make it out of the group and then you beat France, who was one of the the top youth teams in the world uh every year and so uh to to see that and see what the group as a whole was doing because even though i wasn't there it was 
you know, I'd been with them enough and was friends with them. I was extremely excited uh, to see them doing well. And to, and even now, you know, looking at where everybody is, it's uh, it's really cool to see. And it's it's interesting, right, that your coach was uh, Tab Ramos. He's now in Houston. Yeah, he's now at the Houston Ramos. <laughs> he is, yeah. yeah. He's in Houston right now, struggling there, right? Not not the best season for the Dynamo. Kind of used to it by now. A lot of the fans are <laughs> tell me at least. Now let's go to. There's one more question I have for you, and then we can just chat or wrap it up from here. The question I have for you is: talked about the U U nine U twenty. Um, what are your future goals in regard? So right now, obviously, your goal is to have a strong season, right? You just figured out the documentation issue. You figured out. What are your future goals? Do you plan or you want to really challenge yourself and hopefully go to a top five league? Do you want to maybe move to another league in Europe, specifically in the future? Uh, is the Danish league where you want to stay for a while? U.S. men's national team. Has Greg Berhalter ever reached out to you? Uh, want to touch upon that more of the present? Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll say like I'm right now, currently, You know, I've been here in Bonby for three months now, and uh, I'm just getting into the team. And so for me right now, it's just getting more minutes every game and continuing to improve and continuing to learn, you know, a new system, new playing with a new team and uh, really getting comfortable here over time. And so for me, that's my that's my main focus right now. That's really what I'm uh working on uh, with the national team and things like that, you know, that will come one day as a result of, you know, how anybody plays for their club. You know, it's, you have to first perform well at your club before you get that opportunity. And so, you know, being with the national team, I've been with the group two times. Um, and I didn't play in either one, but that also, uh, you know, gives you something to look forward to, you know, because you can see that, you know, you're close, but you're not quite there. And that just gives you a little extra push to 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 fight for something extra as well. You know, if that makes any sense. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's it means the coaching staff or the program is watching. That's why that's why I also asked, is Greg maybe in touch saying, hey, we're keeping an eye on you. Keep the good work, whatever it is, because I know. I do know Greg from time to time. He does reach out to players randomly. He He's very good, even though sometimes I'm overly critical about Greg Berhalter. He's very good, I believe, in keeping it in touch with players, at least from what I've heard, at least. Yeah, no, and uh, he is, and I think that the whole coaching staff is, um, and they do a good job of it. Uh, I've talked to you know, Greg a couple of times over the last year, and when we you know we're looking at going at the olympics and olympic qualifying and stuff like that you know i was talking with jason every once in a while and uh they did a good job of you know checking in and seeing how i was doing and uh i mean they watch you know all of our games i don't know how they have time to do it but they do um for big, everybody big staff <laughs> exactly so they're uh they're keeping a track of of a ton of different players um but for me personally they've done you know, a great job and have made me feel very comfortable even when I come into the group uh, to make it really easy on uh, new guys and young guys, which we have a lot of right now. Mm -hmm. And remember, 20, so 2022 is about a year from now. It's closer, right? So it's harder for anything else to happen. And, and I even think Greg probably has um, a group kind of closed in, especially for the World Cup because it's so close. Hopefully opportunities come along for you as well, but you're 22. So that means in 2026, which would probably be every American's dream, every soccer player, right? Dream to play a World Cup at home. You're going to be 27. So you're going to be and pretty much at your prime, right? And you got plenty of time to that. So that's obviously a goal for you, right? What are you thinking of that? Does that motivate you? Is that something you can think about right now? You just leave it to the side and hope for the best. Just keep working and hope everything works out. I mean, it's of course it's something you think about and dream about because you know I think it's everybody's dream to play in a World Cup, right? That is the actual highest level of soccer. You know, it doesn't get any better than that, really. And um, to play in any World Cup would be a dream come true, right? Whether it's 
next year if you know some crazy things happen or if it's in 26 and then it's at home you know sort of thing or if it's even the one after that you know what i mean but to obviously to have the opportunity to play in a world cup in your home country um just you know you watch the passion of the fans the last couple of world cups when it's their home team you know and I can't even imagine what that would be like in the U.S. I mean, I really can't. I think that would just be great, uh, great atmosphere every game and a great feeling around the whole country and especially for soccer as a whole. I think it'll help the sport um, yeah. tremendously. Yeah, especially when we look back at it, right? So obviously you weren't born yet to watch the 94 World Cup. I was just born at the 94 World Cup, <laughs> so we didn't experience that, right? Not even as a fan, right? We didn't experience that. But if you look at the history of soccer in this country, the growth of it post-94 World Cup is probably the biggest it's ever been. So, and right now we're going to enter 2026 with a country that loves the sport a lot more than 94, so I can't imagine how, just how it's going to be something special. That's all I'll say. And I went to the World Cup in Brazil because I'm also Brazilian and I lived it in my country there and I'm going to live it here in my other country. Uh, it, it's special. I'll tell you that. It's very special and I can't wait for it. But Christian, um, that does it. Hopefully by now, now the viewers can stop asking me so much about you. Now they know <laughs> a lot about you. Now I can just update on your performances and they know enough about you. Is there anything you would like to add just so they stop asking, man. Come on, just help me out. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know what they're asking. Uh, so I don't know if I can help with that part of it. But I just think, you know, there's, for myself, I I feel like I'm in a position where I'm improving every day right now. Um, and I'll continue to improve through the course of this year and the next year. And if, you know, I get the chance to move to a bigger club or a bigger league and then I want to take that chance and I want to keep improving until, uh, you know, one day we find out, you know, how good you are. Uh, and, you know, for me, that's what is going to motivate me to become the best that I can be, you know, and I'll work every day to, until we get there and, if, um, and just see where it takes us. And we're, we'll be here following every week. Uh, we'll be here also cheering as we do for all the Americans abroad and all the Americans in MLS, just all the American players in general. And a special thank you to your dad too, Mr. Kappas, there for <laughs> helping the interview happen. Very active on Twitter, you know, very helpful <laughs> actually. And your dad made this happen as well, guys. So go give him a follow. It's Jay Kappas. I'm not right on yeah. Twitter. Yeah, I'll I put it. So. I'll put it on description or something. Uh, worth a follow. <laughs> I'll be updating every Monday on Christian Kappas and all the Americans abroad. But if you want daily updates on on Christian, his dad. That's the guy to talk to. <laughs> Everyone, thank you very much for watching. If you all don't mind, I forgot to say it. So hit the like button or the dislike button. Either one's fine. Christian, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.